G'day, I'm Gary Stevens, and welcome to the third season of the History in the Bible podcast. In this final season, I explore how the Jews and the Christians constructed new religions when they were sent spinning into the void after the destruction of the temple. All of the history about all of the books beyond the Bible. Episode 3.29 The Last Heirs of Abraham, Part 3 Survivors of the Jungle The Great Revolt did not send the Judeans into a spiral of despair. Yes, the world had been shattered, but they had long memories. The Judeans knew well that the Babylonians had burnt Solomon's temple and sacked Jerusalem almost seven centuries before. As the Jews had endured that, so they would survive the Roman desolation. We know this from two books written in the period. These are attributed to Baruch, scribe to the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah had witnessed the destruction of the first temple. In the book of Four Baruch, Jeremiah and his scribe bury all the sacred treasures of Solomon's temple in a secret place of security. The book assures us that one day the temple will be rebuilt and its riches recovered. The other book, Second Baruch, gives consolation and hope. Quote, Second Baruch 84.2 Remember that formerly Moses said, If you transgress the law, you shall be dispersed. And now Moses used to tell you before they befell you, and lo, they have befallen you. I also say to you after you have suffered, that if you obey those things which have been said to you, you will receive from the Mighty One whatever has been laid up and reserved for you. And remember you the law and Zion, and the Holy Land and your brethren, and the covenant of your fathers, and forget not the festivals and the Sabbaths. End quote. The leading Jewish intellectuals moved to preserve their ancient traditions. With either Roman indifference, or acquiescence, or ignorance, circles of Jewish scribes and scholars established themselves in the little town of Yavne, located not far from the Mediterranean coast. A generation after the fall of the temple, this community had achieved a critical mass that allowed the great Rabbi Akiva ben Yosef to found an academy at their refuge. Few of the early rabbis are held in higher esteem than Rabbi Akiva. Tradition holds that Akiva was the first to collect the oral teachings of the Scatic rabbinic networks into some sort of order that made them easier to memorise and transmit to future generations. So was born the Mishnah. Most of the sages quoted in its pages are Akiva's first or second generation disciples. Their labours would establish rabbinic Judaism as normative Judaism. Just when Akiva was finishing his work, one Simon bar Kosova launched the third and final Judean revolt against Rome. The year was 132. To hear more about bar Kosova, whack some chickpeas into a pressure cooker and rewind to my episode 3.15, Tumultus Judeorum. Akiva was a strong supporter of the man. If tradition is reliable, the great rabbi must have been in his 80s at the time. It was an unwise decision by an old man. This insurrection was confined to a much, much smaller area than the Great Revolt. The Galileans and Samaritans wisely decided to sit this one out. Though Bar Kosova had a smaller manpower pool to draw on, he proved to be a military leader of genius. The Romans took a whole four years to extinguish the rebellion and execute Marcosova. 
Rome inflicted a horrendous punishment, far greater than the penalties imposed after the Great Revolt. Much of the population was killed, exiled or sold into slavery. Modern archaeological digs show that virtually every village in Judea was destroyed. To call it a genocide would not be an understatement. The Judeans were forbidden to enter Jerusalem, save on Tisha B'Av, the great day of mourning. The Romans replaced the Jewish temple with one dedicated to Jupiter. They renamed Jerusalem as Elia Capitolina. Rabbi Akiva was martyred. His death is one of the most moving accounts in the Talmud. The rabbi is about to recite the central prayer of Judaism, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Quote, Berakot 61b When they took Rabbi Akiva out to be executed, it was time for the recitation of Shema, and they were raking his flesh with iron combs, and he was reciting Shema. His students said to him, Our teacher, even now, as you suffer, you recite Shema. He said to them, All my days I have been troubled by the verse with all your soul. I said to myself, When will the opportunity be afforded me to fulfill this verse? Now that it has been afforded me, shall I not fulfill it? He prolonged his uttering of the word one until his soul left his body. A voice descended from heaven and said, Happy are you, Rabbi Akiva, that your soul left your body as you uttered one. End quote. With Akiva gone, the remaining rabbis of Yavne fled for their lives to Galilee, a region untouched by the revolt. Two generations after the fall of the temple, Jews now came to see the Great Revolt of 66 as not some surmountable historical mischance, but a decisive event in their history. The Bar Kosovo Revolt also transformed the internal politics of the emerging imperial church. The corporation consisted of two wings, Jewish Jesus fans and communities of pagan fans. The Jewish communities followed rules unknown to the pagan ones. We have no idea how much the two interacted with each other. We have some evidence that the Jewish wing of the church disappeared after the Bar Kosovo revolt leaving only remnants such as the Ebionites. Before the revolt, all the leaders of the Jerusalem Jesus Club had Hebrew names, beginning with Yaakov, James, brother or cousin or whatever of Jesus. After the revolt, the leaders had Greek names. With the Jewish Mother Foundation dispersed to the winds, the pagan wind of the imperial church was free to forge its own path. The first step along that path was to assemble a new set of prized books to add to the scriptures they inherited from the Jews. By the year 200, every Christian was clear that some Christian books were very special. A few Christians were coming to believe that these singular books formed a new library of sacred scriptures, quite separate from the Jewish scriptures. Shortly after 200, Christians began to use the term New Testament for this collection. The process of canonization was really quite wonky. Marcionites, Gnostics and various church fathers all had different ideas. This New Testament was modelled on the Old Testament. It began with histories, the Gospels and Acts. The letters of Paul paralleled the Prophets. The general letters provided poetry and wisdom. Many of Christianity's innovations were minor. Take the virgin birth and the physical resurrection of Jesus. Were these expunged, the Christian story would barely change. The really big novelty 
It was conflating the vague concepts of the Son of Man, the Son of God, and the Messiah. For more on all that, settle back with a bowl of steamed couscous and rewind to my episode 2.13, Grappling with the Greeks Part 4, Daniel in the Book of Parables. Up to the end of our time period, the year 200, the various Christian communities struggled to articulate their relationship to Judaism. The Christian hero was undeniably a Jew. The earliest Christians embraced the Jewish holy books as their own. Even the Gnostics incorporated Jewish ideas. Oh, and for more on those zanies, why not re-listen to my episode 3.19, Knowing Me, Knowing You, Part 1, The Children of Seth. Only one man, Marcion, tried to ditch those books and sunder Christianity from Judaism. As I related in episode 3.21, the Imperial in Church Incorporate, Part 1, The Heretic, the Church rejected that idea wholesale. The Church was in a quandary. The Roman world was deeply suspicious of shiny new religious movements. Romans prized antiquity over novelty. Even the oddball mystery cults of Eleusis and Samothrace that flourished in the Middle Empire could trace their roots back centuries. The church in corporate had little alternative but to purloin the ancient traditions of Judaism as its own heritage. Christianity was no novelty, they said, but age old. Christians had to confront an immediate problem. How could they justify such a claim when Judaism was still around? Jews were still gathering in synagogues, circumcising and keeping kosher, all of which Christians rejected. Some pagans asked, if Christianity is a revitalised ancient Judaism, then why aren't all Jews Christians? Why do both claim to be the favoured of the same God? Freed of any need to accommodate a sizeable Jewish wing, the Imperial Church in corporate produced several responses to that challenge. Some argued that Christianity must remain true to its Jewish roots. The New Testament fulfills the Tanakh, the Old Testament, but the Tanakh is still true and valid. That was the position taken by the Gospel of Matthew and the Ebionites. Others said that the Tanakh foreshadowed the New. It was a useful pointer, but must now pass away in the face of the reality of Jesus. So said the letter purportedly written by Paul to the Hebrews, that I explored in episode 3.10, Earliest Christians Part 2, Paul against Peter against Thomas. And so, alas, said the venomous Bishop Melito, writing around the year 190. Some communities thought the Jews had completely misunderstood their own books. That was the argue of the Epistle of Barnabas, supposedly written by a companion of Paul. As I related in episode 3.14, after the Apostles Part 2, Holy Books and Blessed Bishops, this scathing letter almost made the cut into the New Testament. The author argues that for their entire history, the Jews willfully misinterpreted their own sacred books. Only Christians understood the Old Testament. Later, Christian fathers took their lead from the strategies of the Epistle of Barnabas. Christianity, they said, was an ancient religion with ancient books, the Tanakh. Some Jews in the empire had failed to understand that the Tanakh was all about Jesus. The Old Testament even prophesied that the Jews would reject Jesus. Proof positive! The Christians got to have their cake and eat it too. We have no evidence that Jews converted to Christianity in any numbers after the Jerusalem Foundation vanished in the mid-2nd century. Only the remnant Ebionites remained, and even they were gone by the year 200. The Jews had several good reasons not to join the Christians and their Messiah. First, 
The many apocalyptic books we have from the Second Temple period all depict the Messiah as a righteous and powerful leader. Many writings held that two messiahs would arrive, one a virtuous priest and another a warrior to claim the throne of David. Whether he was one or two, whether a judge, a general, a priest or a king, the result would be the expulsion of the Romans and the re-establishment of the Jewish kingdom to a position of might and grandeur. Jesus was nothing like the Messiah that the Second Temple literature foretold. Jesus was no triumphant conqueror. He had been executed by the Romans, who were still running the show. Second, many Jews of the time did indeed believe that they would be resurrected to life one day, in Olam Haba, the world to come. They debated about how and when this was supposed to come about, but they all agreed that the great event would mark the end of time and all the righteous dead would be resurrected at the same time. But the Christians had said that only one Jew, just one person, Jesus, had been resurrected without the world ending. To most Jews, that simply made no sense at all. Third, those Jews who did believe in the world to come knew that their place in that world depended on how assiduously they adhered to the terms of God's contract, the law laid down in the Torah. Of course, there were enormous disagreements about what that entailed. Could the oral traditions have something to say? The Pharisees said yes. The Sadducees disagreed. But all agreed that what you did was important, not what you believed. By the second century, the Christians insisted that only correct belief, faith, would get you into God's good graces. And finally, Christian sectarianism repulsed many Jews in the years after Bar Kosovo. Generations before the Bar Kosovo revolt, Jewish groups had no hesitation in launching pungent attacks on their rivals. The Pesha or commentary on the prophet Habakkuk, for example, It's one of the wonders found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Radiocarbon dating places the work as written in the century before the birth of Jesus. In its commentary on Habakkuk 2.5, the Pesha calls out the wicked priest. Quote, 1 QP Hab 8.8 This concerns the wicked priest, who was called by the name of truth when he first arose. But when he ruled over Israel, His heart became proud, and he forsook God and betrayed the precepts for the sake of riches. He robbed and amassed the riches of men of violence, who rebelled against God, and he took the wealth of the peoples, heaping sinful iniquity upon himself. And he lived in the ways of abominations amidst every unclean defilement. Woo! End quote. We have no idea who the wicked priest was, although many scholars believe him to have been one of the Maccabean kings. What more Maccabees? Who doesn't? Then you really must check out episode 2.15, The Rise and Ruin of the Maccabees. After Bar Kosovo, the rabbis did their best to stamp out such sectarianism. The rabbis did flirt briefly with the concept of heresy, but only briefly. The civil war that was an important part of the Great Revolt had revealed in all its bloody horror the catastrophes that such dissensions could spawn. Instead, the rabbis institutionalised polite and scholarly disagreement. As I discussed in episode 3.23, the Imperial Church in Corporate Part 3, The Heresy Hunter, the influential church fathers Justin Martyr and Irenaeus devised the concept of heresy, wrong belief, which they defined as any belief that differed from theirs. The church integrated that into its very DNA. From that time on, the opponents of the imperial church were not merely misguided, or mistaken, or ignorant, or foolish. They were maliciously evil, the spawn of Satan. The Jews refused to march down the broad apocalyptic avenue 
that the Christians so boldly followed, with banners flying. After two disastrous wars and a terrorist insurgency, the rabbis were convinced that that highway led only to catastrophe. The rabbis also erased the Enochite apocalyptic tradition by the time the Mishnah was compiled, around 200 CE AD. For more on that interesting tradition, rewind just two episodes and check out The Last Heirs of Abraham Part 1, Setting the Stage. Early Christians preserved Enochite ideas for rather longer. The letter of Jude and First Peter quote Enoch. Enochite notions about the Son of Man and the Messiah percolate through many books of the New Testament. Church fathers through the 3rd century quoted Enochite ideas with approval. After Christianity became the state religion in the 4th century, Christianity moved to a more philosophical theology and discreetly forgot about Enoch. Enoch would only be restored to Western sight by British literary adventurers in the early 19th century. For more on that, rewind to episode 3.4, Before the Great Revolt, part 2, The Apocalyptic Christians. Today, the works of Enoch are only canon in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and prominent in the Mormon work, The Pearl of Great Price. Like the Christians, the Jews form a new book, the Mishnah, to reinvent the Tanakh. Unlike the Christians, the Jews never called their new texts scriptures, nor did they label them a new covenant. The new Christian books had ransacked the Jewish tradition for symbols and motifs, for narrative forms and ways of explaining the world. The rabbis found their heritage plundered. Whether they did it consciously or not, the rabbis abandoned every literary form that the Christians stole. They invented the legal digest and commentary, a genre hitherto unknown in Judaism. This genre was both enduring and remarkably homogeneous, persisting for at least four centuries. Scholars are divided about what influence, if any, the Christian movement had on the rabbinic movement. Many Jewish scholars are adamant that in the second century that ended with the compilation of the Mishnah, the evolving Christian religion had no effect on the evolving rabbinic Judaism. They argue that right through the second century, Christians were so scarce, and mainly pagan, that few rabbis would have even heard of them, let alone reacted to them. Yet in the year 100, the Roman state was well apprised of the Christian movement. Guestimates, and they are only guestimates, suggest 8,000 Christians in the empire at that time. They may have been few in an empire of 60 million, but it seems they were quite noisy. You can catch up with that in episode 3.18, Christians under the Roman gaze. Untested evidence suggests that a few decades later, Locals in the provinces hounded Christians. More guesstimates place Christian numbers at anywhere from 60,000 to 150,000 by the year 200. If both Roman governors and the general populace had heard of the Christians, why not the rabbis? The jury is out on whether or not the rabbinic movement paid any attention to the expanding imperial church. Some scholars reason that this near-rabbinic silence about Christianity was a strategic choice. Don't look at the neighbours. These professors argue that the rabbis treated the Christians with contemptuous silence. An argument from silence is always fraught, but who knows? I sure don't. Let me conclude by asking, when did Christianity and Judaism actually split? Well... Surely that's obvious. The traditional scholarly position is that church and synagogue parted ways very early. The fracture was there from the very beginning. If the book of Acts can be trusted, there was certainly tension between the two right from the start. Quote, Acts 6.1 Now during those days, 
when the disciples were increasing in number. The Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. End quote. Modern scholars, led by Daniel Boyaren, Professor of Talmudic Culture at the University of California, Berkeley, argue that we are asking the wrong question. Nobody's split from anybody. The metaphor is wrong. A much better analogy is that of the jungle. Second Temple Judaism was a lush jungle of species. Towering above all were the mighty trees of the temple establishment, confident in their domination of the environment. Many other flora flourished. Essenes, Sadducees, Pharisees, Boethusians, and so many others. All competed for nourishment from the fertile soil that was Judean intellectual life in the Second Temple period. When the Romans arrived, they installed Herod the Great as king of the jungle. His children failed to impress the Romans with their husbandry skills and found themselves replaced by Roman governors. These insipid imperial bureaucrats preferred to log the forest for their own gain rather than nurture it. When the jungle fought back in the Great Revolt and the Barkosova Revolt, the Romans destroyed the flora with their own version of Agent Orange. The centuries-old forest of Second Temple Judaism contained many blooms. The emerging rabbinic and Christian movements were simply the two who escaped the Roman immolation. The Christians soon spawned their own subspecies, such as Marcionites and Gnostics. Time to change metaphors? These surviving communities spent decades, if not centuries, scrambling to define themselves against each other. I know which clique I belong to. I'm not really sure if your mob is the same as mine. All strove to make boundaries, to protect their own group against others. These boundaries warped and wobbled. This was a complex process of mutual definition, of testing of borders, of testing definitions of what could be shared and what would be differential. In the final episode of my grand narrative, next time I engage in some speculation and alternative history. Thanks for visiting. For show notes, maps, charts, and timelines, visit my website at www.historyinthebible.com. You can even download professional posters for free.